there's a point where you, you know, you really have to keep your ego in check. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you start to think that you can do anything. Yeah. Right. Well, you can't do everything. Yeah. And um, so that was one that was uh, that was very capital intensive at the, at that point in time for me, and I had to make a decision. And this wasn't gonna work. Right. I shut it down. Right. And it's not easy to do that because you're, you know, you have a, you know, your mindset is to make everything work. Of course, yeah. Right. Don't give up. The problem is it takes too much of your time, right. too much of your management's time, other people's time. Right. With no return. Hi, Luke Hanson McDonald here. Welcome back to Beyond the Family Business. Today we have something very special. We had a chance to sit down with one of Eastern Canada's best known entrepreneurs, Rob Steele. He's a Newfoundlander second generation of a prolific family of entrepreneurs. His father, Harry Steele, is a legend. Uh, He's a huge philanthropist around here as well. uh, He's built one of the largest auto dealer roll-ups in Canada. He's recently expanded into Texas, which we get into. Uh, He's recently launched a whiskey brand with Kiefer Sutherland. He's friends with the Rolling Stones. He is one of the most interesting people in the world. And uh, Rob was kind enough to sit down with us and tell us about his story, uh, some of the bumps and bruises he had starting his business, as well where he thinks he's going next, uh, and his view on the EV market and and what that will look like in the auto sector. You're going to find this one super interesting. Enjoy. Well, you know what? Why don't we, to, to break the ice, uh, I want to ask you a couple sort of more personal questions of what's your favorite music or your favorite band? <laughs> favorite band, man, there's no doubt the Rolling Stones. And yeah. you've seen them live before. I have, yeah. Mm-hmm. When was the first time you saw them live? 1981, Rich Stadium, Buffalo, New York. So, yeah. as a little thank you for you coming <laughs> along here, I was able to track down a guy who attended that concert and he has a t-shirt oh my God. from wow. that Rolling yes. Stones show. Yes, I actually had this t-shirt, this same t-shirt. And he actually... That's amazing. Wow, that, that, that really means a lot. And he really actually has a, a ticket. ticket from the concert. That's right. That's Jeez, how did you... Wow, that is fantastic. Oh, absolutely. I'm amazed at that. I love the Stones, too. I, yeah. I grew up with them. My dad was always obsessed yeah. with them. Yeah. And I was lucky enough, I got to see them play in Toronto back in the late 90s. And yeah. Well, the interesting thing is I was uh, I was 19 at that point in time when I saw them. And, you know, going, living in uh, Newfoundland, I was going to Memorial University. And uh, this was obviously predates internet and, you know, the, the, the access that people have to, to content now. Sure. So it was, it was rare to get the opportunity. And there wasn't as much mobility in those days. Yeah, know? yeah. So the concert they were playing in Buffalo, New York, and there was a there was a company that was offering uh, bus rides yeah. to Buffalo. Yeah. And now we were in St. John's, Newfoundland, right? So we flew to Toronto and took the bus from Toronto to Buffalo. Yeah. And uh, it, it was literally like a, like a yellow school bus. Yeah, yeah. And uh, took forever. And the lineups were, it's, but we didn't care. Yeah, you know, exactly. Right? We You're 19, you know, yeah. you're just happy to be yeah. there. I was at it. It was a great show. There's yeah. about 80,000 people there. <laughs> so, all right. Ice broken. Um, why don't we start off with who are you um, and what do you do? My name is Rob Steele. I'm uh, CEO of Steele Auto Group and owner of Steele Auto Group. We have uh, 55 dealerships here in Canada, all Atlanta, Canada, and uh, nine dealerships currently in Texas. Okay. Um, we have a number of uh, body shops. We have three uh, power centers that you know sell uh, ATVs. And, sure, you know, sell wheels, that kind of thing. How did you get into that business? Which one, the car? The car, yeah, car. Uh, I got into business in my when I was uh, late twenties, about twenty eight. And uh, previous to that, I was uh, I uh, had the Auto Trader franchise for Newfoundland. Oh wow. And uh, I sold that, and when I had sold that, I didn't know really what I was going to do, but I happened to know car dealers from, you know, with the auto trader, and there was a sure. particular car dealer in Halifax, uh, Tom Collins, who owned Collins Chrysler, and uh, he wanted to sell. So myself and uh, two other people partnered, uh, three of us, and we bought Tom out, 
not knowing mm-hmm. anything about the car business at all. Yeah. Totally agree. You know? Yeah, yeah. And then how did it start to scale? Because I think you mentioned it. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's this interesting thing about scale. I uh, The concept of scaling was, wasn't even on my radar at sure. that point in time. You know, when you're a young person, you're not thinking about uh, scaling or, you know, how are you going to grow your business. I just wanted to uh, kind of do things that I like doing. Yeah. I wanted to be kind of in an environment that I like being in. Yeah, yeah. I like the automotive environment. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, I didn't have any, any uh, you know, grand vision of being a consolidator in the car business. Sure. Uh, but I, I kind of, uh, it kind of took off from there. I mean, the first couple of years were really, really tough. One, um, you know, I had two partners and uh, anybody that's uh, been in business, you know, partnerships can be tough. Yeah, right? definitely. And, uh, you know, none of us were, were, were really understood the car business, so we struggled with the, so it was a learning curve on that. Mm-hmm. Uh, eventually, I ended up uh, buying my partners out. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and uh, after the third year, we started getting some traction, mm-hmm. getting some money in the business. Mm-hmm. And uh, after a couple of years of that, just out of sheer boredom, I wanted to another challenge. Sure. And uh, I found, uh, uh, I went and uh, bought another dealership. And it sort of went from there. And so when you bought another dealership, was the idea that you were going to be able to find some, you know, synergies between it or some efficiencies, or was it really just, yeah. you know, something else to do? I didn't have a, a, a vision of scaling up dealerships. I didn't think I was going to go, you know, like what I bought, you know, a second dealership, then eventually I bought a third and mm-hmm. so on. Um, but I, uh, it just kind of happened. Right? Yeah. And as I got going, I built this platform. Mm-hmm. I recognized that there was an opportunity to mm-hmm. scale. Yeah, yeah. Now, in those days, it was very different because uh, the OEMs, yeah. original equipment manufacturers, yes. the term OEMs, Ford, Chrysler, you know, GM, all those, um, they did not encourage cross ownership of brands. Why was that? Because the, the, the philosophy from the OEM perspective then was that, uh, that somebody uh, that was representing their brand, if you were the dealer, a Ford dealer, for example, that you were better off, that you would be loyal to the brand. Sorry, my dad's just there behind us. <laughs> How are you? Make a face at me. Apologies. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that you would be loyal to the brand, right? And that representing another brand, you couldn't be as right. loyal to ours. Yeah, yeah, you right? lose focus. And, and so, so, the, so the, the networks and the dealer model was, from the OEM perspective, was to have individual ownership, right? Right, not a network. So how did you convince them to let you do it? It, it was a little bit of a, uh, it was a little bit of it was I won't say subterfuge, but mm-hmm. it was uh, it was a little bit of sort of turning your head the other way. On that right. bit, you know, uh, my second dealership was actually a Hyundai dealership. Mm-hmm. Hyundai, back in the early '90s, was a fledgling brand. Yeah, for sure, Very fledgling. And I think the fact that it was fledgling and not well established, I think uh, Chrysler at that point in time, which was my first dealership, um, kind of turned the other way, turned their head the other way. Just, uh, well, it's, uh, you know. Um, but of course, nowadays, they encourage OEMs, like uh, they, they want to have professional management. They want to have professional right. dealers. Because you get consistency. The consistency. Yeah. Uh, capital to invest in insurance sure. upgrades, all those, all those things. Right, it's very difficult for an independent. Right. So you've recently uh, expanded into Texas. Mm-hmm. That was in the 2010s that you did that. 2020. 2020. Okay, so very recently. Yeah. During COVID. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, it was that? actually it was at the deal. We, we actually struck a deal. Uh, uh, Benny Boyd had two Dodge Chrysler dealerships, one in Gonzales, Texas, and one in. Uh, a uh, locker Texas. Okay. And uh, uh, I did a deal with Benny. Uh, would have been uh, March of 2020, mm-hmm. early March. And if you remember, mid March 2020 mm-hmm. was when everything, the whole COVID thing just. Of course. Blew up, right? Yeah. What was that like putting uh, that, that deal tough. together in the middle of COVID? That was tough. He was a great guy to deal with. For sure. Yeah. Uh, we ended up doing, uh, I mean, the negotiation was, there wasn't much negotiation. He, he was very. Easy to deal with. His price was reasonable, mm-hmm. and uh, he, it turns out he's somebody that's uh, that's done a lot of deals. So we do have a nice right. experience. He was comfortable with him. Why? Well, we actually had to close that deal remotely because we couldn't travel. 
Right. Okay. Yeah, so you have to do everything that was, over that was, Zoom. That was and really, really tough, yeah. Why do you go to Texas? Why, Texas is very, uh, I like, I, I've been drawn because I like music and, uh, and art and that kind of thing. Um, Austin, Texas, uh, I've been going since the late 1990s. Oh, wow. And I've always loved it down there. I bought a home there in, uh, in the mid-2006. Uh, and uh, I just I just really like the vibe of Texas. And Texas is a very business-friendly state. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, uh, you know, nowhere's perfect. Everywhere, you know, there's, there's pros and cons wherever you go. The weather was nice there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, again, the, uh, the, the, the tax environment, the business environment, the regulatory environment are favorable towards business. So yeah. it's a, and, and there's a lot of people. Yeah. You know, yeah, you're talking yeah. about 30 million people in, in the state of Texas. Right. So you got uh, Canada and a much smaller landmass. Yeah, exactly. And uh, so. Is it different as far as the OEM relationships go, or is it? It is. Yeah. It is different. It's a, it's a great question. It's, uh, uh, I find in the U.S. they're uh, they're very much more uh, involved in your business right. than they are in Canada. Right. They're a lot more involved. Really, really? involved. Yeah. They, 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 there's more um, oversight. Or? I think there's they're, they're they're very competitive down there, and I think they they, they you know they want to they you have to hit your sales targets. You have to perform. You have to right. hit your customer satisfaction indexes. All those things. Right. Yeah. But you've also been brand agnostic down there as well. You're not just with no. a single OEM. No, no. Currently in Texas, we have uh, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, um, Dram. Uh, we've got uh, Hyundai, uh, General Motors, Buick, GMC. Uh, what else? Uh, BW. Just bought the BW dealership in Waco, Texas. Yes, I saw that. And uh, I think that's it. Yeah. And have you... Have you had to set up a separate team for that operation down there? I have. It's a bit of a hybrid. Um, I have uh, some senior uh, team members here that mm -hmm. oversee uh, the, the interface with the team in Texas. Mm -hmm. But we have an HR person in Texas now. We have a uh, general sales manager. Uh, so we're building up an amid team in right. Texas. So right now we have nine dealerships there. It'll it'll sort of be a... Uh, a, a It'll, it'll be kind of a mirror of what I've done in Canada is my, my idea. Sure. And I'm not, I'm not just focused on just Texas. Okay. There are other states as well. Oh, very so, cool. Yeah. Just building on that, not to ask too many questions, but the automotive sector, mm -hmm. there's been lots of changes with EV, et cetera. Um, you know, Tesla obviously has changed how they do retail in some cases, buying online. Do you think that there's uh, any major revolution going on within that sector anytime soon, or is it? There is. There's so much happening in, in, in the automotive world right now um, with this transition to EV. Mm. Uh, the challenge right now uh, that I see with EV, and it's only about 3% of the market in Atlantic Canada, mm -hmm. about six, five, six percent in Canada, the total, mm -hmm. but Atlantic Canada is actually less. You know, there's range issues. There's not enough range. Sure. Right? And the cost, the acquisition cost, of it, yeah. you know, it's expensive. And there's no infrastructure. Yeah. So uh, at this point in time, uh, an EV is really good for in town as right. a second vehicle, yeah. not as a primary vehicle. Yeah. Um, what we're seeing, and this could change, but what we're seeing is it's really being pushed by government right. more than the consumer demanding. Right. And uh, so there's some political aspects to to EV as well. Sure. But um, you know, once the infrastructure is built out, and costs come down, and range extends, mm -hmm. uh, you will see market share grow. Right. Um, but the 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 EVs themselves are they have this image of you know being green, much greener than ICE vehicles. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, and the only green thing about an EV is the emissions. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the the uh, manufacturing of the, of the the batteries, the batteries of the cars, yeah, um, uh, you know the uh, it's their their uh, their carbon footprint is pretty extensive. Right. Um, that being said, I mean, if, and then we have to supply the the, the the electricity for them. Yeah. And in, in this part of the world, it's all coal fired. Yeah. So yeah. Th there's it's really uh, it's very early stages for EV, and I don't know. I'll probably be out of the business by the time it's it's if, full if, if it becomes a maturity. Oh wow! Yeah. Okay, 
do you, so you uh, is it fair to say you don't think it's going to be like the smartphone where nobody had them and then suddenly everybody had one? I, I, you know, that's a great that's a great that's a great uh, concept. I, I thought the same thing because your your uncle, of course, was very successful with that. Uh, with, the, with, the, with the telephone, and uh, uh, I don't. I, I think it's different. It's, I think it's hard to draw that analogy because uh, you know phones were nobody had phones other mm-hmm. than in, in their house. Yeah. Uh, cars are there's you know ice vehicles are, are internal combustion engine ice they call them, yep. are, uh, are are fuel efficient as you know and their emissions are. I mean, uh, very low now. Sure. Right. Uh, Exxon's talking about coming up with fuel with zero emissions. Really? So, you know, who knows where yeah. this is going? It's, it's really all about, uh, it's about the emissions are the thing. Right? Yeah. I mean, and, and uh, a carbon footprint. Yeah. Climate. That's, that's really the thing. And uh, EV is, is I, I'm going to say, likely the future, mm-hmm. but I think it's a far way off. I think it's a long way off. Oh, interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very interesting. If it's uh, good with you, why don't we segue into Day Wu? <laughs> well, it's, so yeah, there was a there was a, uh, uh, a brand called Day Wu um, that came to Canada, and I can't remember the year now. I'm going to say it was uh, late 19. Uh, actually, it might have been in the 2000s. Um, anyway. At that point in time, I was rolling pretty good. I had, uh, you know, the dealerships going and uh, running new cap, the broadcast side, um, and uh, always looking to grow and, uh, you know, for a challenge. Uh, they were looking to set up a dealer network here, and there was quite a competitive process to get that franchise. I was successful in getting the franchise. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, it never really took root in Canada um, for whatever reason. They had pretty good product. But the problem, when I looked at the investment I made in that, which was significant, building the dealership and whatnot, um, there was a point where, you, you know, you really have to keep your ego in check. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you start to think that you can do anything. Yeah. Right? Well, you can't do everything. Right? Yeah. And um, so that was one that was, uh, that was very capital intensive at, the, at that point in time for me. And I had to make the decision that this wasn't going to work. Right. I shut it down. Right. And it's not easy to do that because you're, you know, you have a, it, you know, your mindset is to make everything work. Of course, yeah. Right. Don't give up. The problem is it takes too much of your time, right. too much of your management's time, other people's time. Right. With no return. Yep. And is that effort and energy being better, being redirected? Right. To what is to working. Better returning yeah. areas. You know, I had to sort of, you know, check my ego and, and make the right decision and just shut it down. Wow. Yeah. And I did the same thing with, uh, with the Mitsubishi in the early days, same, same process. Uh, that day we became Mitsubishi dealership, and then we struggled with that as well in the early days. I'm happy to say we have Mitsubishi today, and it's flourishing. Awesome. It's great. That's yeah. excellent to hear. Going through a change like that, you know, having to make the decision to shut down the Daewoo dealership, what was that like for, you know, not to ask too personal, but what was that like for you personally? You know, was there, did it make you doubt yourself at all, or... Did you just keep your head down and, and just grind through it, you know, until you saw the light? Yeah, I I, uh, I have a different attitude on that now. At the time, I was probably a little bit. Uh, I thought it was. Uh, I thought it would be more obvious to people. It wasn't. Nobody really cares. You yeah. Know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah. It just, it just, you just you you come to realize that you know you can't make everything successful. Sure. You know, and you only have so much time, so much energy. Yeah, and where are you going to place that? Where are you going to direct? Right. And uh, you know, if it's if it's to, towards something that you're not getting any return, mm-hmm. and for the foreseeable future, you're probably not going to get any return. Right. Uh, you're better off just to do something else. Do something else. Yeah. Is that something you do? Uh, you know, annual review of now, where you think about where your time All is being time. spent? All the time. Yeah. Yeah. Time yeah. management is critical. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Um, and saying no, get to a, you know, with, saying yes or no has consequences. Yeah. Right? Um, so you really, uh, uh, it's, it's hard to say no sometimes, but you're better off saying no yeah. and fast. Right. As opposed to silence and not saying anything. Because yeah. that, that, that implies a maybe. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And you waste more time and mm-hmm. all kinds of things. Now that's, that's really good advice as well. Um, 
how, how do you remove the emotion from your decision making? You know, it's you, tough. It's tough. It's uh, because it's uh, I mean, emotions, it's a real thing. It's yeah. a real thing you have to deal with. But it also can impair your judgment. Yeah. Right. Um, so, you, you, I, you know, I, I, I don't know how to articulate how you do that other than uh, you, you just you try to think of what what what's the if I what's the outcome of this decision versus going this other direction. If mm-hmm. I make this decision, what's the outcome? If I make this decision, what's the outcome? And these are just judgment calls. Mm-hmm. And it really comes down to trying to make the best judgment. Do you find that, you know, uh, time alone is what's needed? You know, go for a run or meditate, or is it something you actually prefer to do in a brainstorm to get other opinions on it, you know, to help you get to that objective decision making? You know, it's great, 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 great segue there. All those things, <laughs> right? It really is. Yeah. Yeah. You know, my own, I, I like to, uh, I like to bounce things off of the team, off of people. Uh, I like to take in as much uh, perspectives as I can mm-hmm. and, uh, and sort of mash them all together and try to process it all and come up with the, what I think is the best. Yeah. Best call. Yeah. But see, it's important to do all that stuff, to, you know, to take time along with it. Whatever that is, whatever you're, whatever, wherever you can get in a Zen kind of state. Whether, sure. Whether it's meditation or running. Or go to a Stones you know, concert. A couple of concerts, probably not the place to do that. Yeah. <laughs> and last thing, you just launched a uh, whiskey brand. Yeah, right? that's right. And uh, and I guess, do you want to talk about that quickly at all? Well, uh, myself and three other uh, uh, partners, we launched a uh, whiskey here in uh, Actually, we're going to put a roller right, right across Canada. Awesome. And uh, into uh, Europe and uh, America in the fall. It's called Red Bank Whiskey. Okay. And it's celebrity endorsed. One of our partners, Kiefer Sutherland, the author. Awesome. Um, he's, uh, he's got uh, some of these bees a partner, an equity partner in, in, in the project. Sure. And, uh, you know, I'm not a whiskey drinker. I don't know anything about whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, we. Uh, we uh, we concocted this this uh, this this particular uh, whiskey with uh, with a gentleman that's a professional in that area. Sure. And taste tested it, taste tested it, taste tested various ones. And settled on this. Right. And uh, even though I'm not a whiskey drinker, uh, obviously I've, I've tried this and it's it's it's, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> what, and where is it made? It's uh, right now. It's made in Ontario. Okay. Awesome. And uh, yeah, yeah. That's great. Mm-hmm. Can't wait to try it. Yeah. All right, sir. Thank you very much for your time. All right. I'm Luke Hanson McDonald. This is Beyond the Family Business. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe. And you know it. Share with other business families or family businesses that you may know. Thank you so much. Take care.